morning, everyone. It's an enormous pleasure uh, to introduce Pascal. She's a very, very good friend. And it's always very difficult to introduce someone who has such a CV that we cannot leave almost anything out. Everything sounds so amazing in her CV. So she was born in Shanghai. Uh, to professional artist parents. I think that she will tell us a bit of her journey into AI. She received her PhD in computer science from Columbia in 1997. She worked and studied at prestigious institutions in the US, in France, in Japan, AT&T Bell Labs, BBN Systems and Technologies, LIMC, CNRS, um, Kyoto University, Ecole Centrale de Paris. She speaks seven European and Asian languages, which is amazing. Okay, right now, she's a professor at two departments at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, also a visiting professor at the Central Academy of Fine Arts in Beijing. And she's a fellow of a number of very prestigious institutions, IEEE, of course, AAAI, the Association for the Advancement of Artificial Intelligence, ACL, the Association for Computational Linguistics, and ISCA, the International Speech Communication Association. And her lines about being elevated to fellow run for significant contributions in conversational AI, in ethical AI principles and algorithms, statistic NLP, building intelligent systems that can understand and empathize with humans, contributions to human machine interactions and the interdisciplinary area of spoken language, human machine interactions. It's all about the same. Mm -hmm. She's also the director of the Center for AI Research, an interdisciplinary research center on top of all four schools at the Hong Kong University. And she's the founding chair of the Women Faculty Association as well. And she's an expert on the Global Future Council, a think tank for the World Economic Forum. She also represents her university on partnership on AI to benefit people and society. She's in a number of boards um, and serves on uh, as editor, so as editor and associate editor for a number of very prestigious journals. Today, she's going to tell us about a fascinating topic. Who is responsible for responsible AI? Pascal, the floor is yours. Thank you, Isabel. You are so generous. Um, you have always been the role model in our field, and uh, including me, myself. And uh, I'm very honored to uh, be introduced by you. And I'm very honored to be invited to progress today. Um, ICAST was one of the first conference I ever attended as a young uh, student. So, uh, um, so I'm very, I feel very honored today. Uh, this is a big topic. Uh, so today I won't have a whole lot of time to go into a lot of details. I just want to introduce maybe the area to those of you who might not have thought about it and others who are actually working actively on it. So responsible AI is sort of like a new terminology for, I would say, actually a new approach in AI. Um, you know, um, uh, traditionally, we didn't talk about what we do at ICASP as AI, but signal processing. But in fact, uh, a lot of what we do is indeed what's uh, defined as AI today. So <clears throat> the dimensions of responsible AI ranges from security, privacy, to model robustness, distributional shifts, <clears throat> Safety, value alignment, interpretability, explainability, fairness, user agency, sustainability, and legality, of course. Now, what we do uh, as a signal processing uh, or electrical engineers, um, uh, so when we work on, in my area, is spoken language understanding and uh, you know, machine translation, uh, signal, um, all kinds of signal processing. I call them signal processing. So medical signal processing, 
um, today is part of um, you know, applications of AI. Now, uh, in the field of speech, we have always been concerned with number two, right? Because to make a model work, we've always been concerned with number two ro model robustness. But uh, we have not traditionally been very concerned about one, two, uh, the, uh, the other items on this. And um, I will say that uh, my, my experience, my first job as a signal processing researcher, uh, AI researcher was at BBN System Technologies. And I remember very, one of the very first project was actually a speech command for fighter jet pilots. So the pilots can use a voice command to fire um, bombs. And uh, for some weird reason, like none of us was concerned about the application because uh, that was 1990, 1990. I think none of us thought that was really something that's very, very gonna be, you know, really used uh, uh, broadly. So, and then fast forward to um, 2020, uh, to, uh, no, 2019, well, before COVID. So, and I remember sitting on the expert um, forum for the United Nations uh, facing 200 some ambassadors to the United Nations. Um, talking about um, the, um, the future of um, lethal autonomous weapons, right? So they asked electric engineers about our opinion on uh, the future of uh, the application and the development and safe, safety development of lethal autonomous weapons. So that was like a huge shift uh, in my journey as a professional electrical engineer, as a processing researcher to going from unconcerned to uh, being an expert and uh, working on advising uh, various strategic developments of AI. So um, talk about feeling responsible, right? Um, so these are the you know, different stakeholders in AI today. It's no longer just us researchers. Um, there are a lot of developers making downstream tasks, downstream systems from what we, uh, what we uh, uh, output as research results, uh, businesses that are using those uh, applications to make profit. There are policymakers, government regulators who are actively working on um, standards uh, of uh, for responsible AI. In particular, for example, uh, IEEE has this many standards group working on ethically aligned design and other aspects, um, corporate regulation of using uh, responsible AI. And let's not forget about users, right? Um, so humans are a huge part of this responsibility. We, we are the ones who build AI and we are the ones who are responsible. Now, again, I, I will talk about a bit of my own journey. So um, when I look back since uh, 1988, uh, I've entered the field of speech recognition, okay? My, my, my interest in AI was, well, I loved robots when I was little and science fiction and so on, but what really happened was 1988 as a student in France, I was uh, given a project to do a, a literature review of the state of the art of speech recognition. And I wrote that review in, in French, uh, which I'm not sure I can do today, but that was 1988. State of the art of speech recognition was basically the recognition of phonemes, right? And uh, I enter uh, companies like BBN and also, which was a DAPA contractor and I told you, um, we had these DAPA contracts that are military applications. And, uh, and I wasn't really aware of our responsibility per se. I just felt that we need to build a uh, system that can interact with uh, machines between humans and machines. And that's how I entered into conversational AI in the late eighties and early nineties. And um, since my background, you know, I grew up and uh, lived in five countries, over three continents, Europe, uh, Asia, and, uh, you, you, and North America. Um, and and I, I actually didn't study language per se. I'm not a linguist, but I kind of had to learn those languages to, to, to live there. So I became clean, keenly interested in multilingual speech because uh, I realized that a lot of the issues we're talking about in speech recognition and then especially in natural language processing was very, very much uh, European language uh, centered. And you know, Chinese, Japanese are such different languages um, that a lot of the issues and a lot of the challenges we, we face in those uh, areas are not being addressed. So that was the beginning of my interest in multilingual speech and language. 
and uh, actually the beginning of my interest in uh, what we call low representation languages or low resource languages. And in 1998, when I went back to Hong Kong, I started a group in uh, human language uh, research. And I became, again, keenly interested in uh, um, developing the, the applications of Mandarin uh, speech recognition. At the time, English speech recognition, Japanese speech recognition was already being commercialized, but not Mandarin. And to me, I realized that since almost all Mandarin speakers are both native speakers, but with regional accents, that if we don't deal with uh, accented speech, we will, not able, we will not be able to represent Mandarin speakers and uh, commercialize such systems. So I became interested in accented speech. And then, uh, well, and then all that time, I was an engineer who's interested in, you know, the accuracy rate, the word error rate and so on. And I believed uh, very strongly that what we do, as long as, uh, uh, as long as they are, they are, um, working robust, someday they will be beneficial. And uh, I wasn't very interested in, in applications uh, um, in, in med medical domain and so on. But then around 2015, I, uh, I had a health crisis. I talked about this at various forums and I will share here, which is that I, 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 dis uh, I was discovered to have breast cancer. It was very quickly, I was sent to the hospital and had uh, uh, breast cancer surgery. I had mastectomy, reconstruction, and so on. So I was a very, and I'm still a very, very healthy person. Never thought I would get sick of anything, but that was a huge health crisis. Now, when I was in the hospital recovering, I realized what the nurses and the doctors were doing, other than the technical part, which is you know surgeries and so on. The nurses were giving me medicine and so on. The very important role they were playing towards patients were what's called a bedside manners, meaning they talk to patients. They, um, they, they empathize with our pain, our concern, our stress. And that's a big part of care. That's a big part of healthcare. That is that uh, they understand not just our requests, you know, we are in pain, but um, verbally, but they also look at our facial expressions and how we feel and they empathize with our feelings. That's when I had this epiphany in a hospital bed that what we need as co in a conversational AI was not just the recognition of what people say, but how they say it. And the, uh, uh, then I, I, I realized that what we need is machines that are empathetic. That's when I started working on empathetic machines. And I uh, proposed that conversational AI needs to have this emotion recognition element as an essential part of human to machine communication, because that is the essential part of human to human communication. And then around the same time as I recovered from cancer, I started uh, uh, talking about what we do in, in conversational AI to different stakeholders uh, at the World Economic Forum and so on. People started being very interested in what we do. And uh, never before these people, a um, lot of stakeholders were very interested in what we do. And our, there was actually an AI trust crisis. Uh, around that time, there were people saying that AI would be existential uh, threat to humans and so on, right? So facing that trust crisis, um, I was forced to, uh, you know, whenever I was giving a presentation about our work in conversational AI, I was asked these kind of philosophical questions. Where, why are we doing this research? Should we be doing this research? Starting with my, um, when I talk about empathetic machines, there are questions about, why do we want to make machines empathetic? Why do we want to make machines more human? Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? And uh, that was the, uh, the beginning of my journey into this responsible AI realm, which is that <clears throat> when we do um, research and development, we are not just responsible for what, what we do, but we also are responsible for what it can possibly be uh, applied to do the societal impacts and so on. So that's a big departure from my professional journey up until then, where I was kind of like all only worry about our accuracy and so on. So um, I will skip uh, my, my, my resume and where I have been, but I want to point out two important things. One is the establishment of fa Women Faculty Association. Uh, that was in 2010. And I think that I know that that's the first uh, Women Faculty Association in, uh, in, in Asia. 
And I'm proud to say that, uh, so we did a lot of work and some successful, some not successful. But what I'm proud to say is that, um, you know, as of before I left for this trip to ACL, uh, the day before our university announced the first woman president in the history of our university and in the history of any Asian co-ed research university ever. And that I think, I think that's sort of a nice milestone for our Women Faculty Association, our support for women leadership and our support for mentoring women and so on. So there have been various uh, activities in promoting and networking with women. And for example, this very event, I think <clears throat> it's very, very, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> very, very helpful to young women as well as to senior women. And then in 2018, uh, I founded and uh, 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 chaired this Center for AI Research and that the acronym is CARE. And you can imagine with the I, the human in the middle, it means how can we use AI to, to benefit humans and society? So that's a big paradigm shift in my head of how I do my research and development to how we do it today. So this center, we reach out to multidisciplinary uh, researchers and we collaborate for the first time. The associate director of this center is, the, uh, is a social scientist. And we've established a uh, joint lab uh, with the likes of Cambridge University on AI ethics and governance. In addition to, in addition to joint lab on AI health. And uh, I will also uh, talk about, uh, I won't have time to talk about it. I will mention that we have a joint lab with the Central Academy of uh, Fine Arts to do AI art. Now, <clears throat> I don't have time to talk about AI art, but to me, AI art is, um, the, the role of doing art with AI is just the role, the same role of doing AI, uh, doing art in general, which is to push human creativity, right? To push our imagination of what we can do. So in the latest work that I collaborated with the artist Shibing, we came out with the first um, fully automatic uh, neural generated film. And in doing that, we actually had to come up with new AI algorithms. Like in traditionally, uh, the uh, defense applications tend to push, you know, DAPA applications tend to push us to come up with new algorithms, which eventually benefit uh, uh, lay people and the society. I hope that we will do AI art in a way to push our development of our algorithms to benefit um, downstream applications. Now, when I talk about values and so on, I want to point out, you know, people talk about what is ethics and so on. Now, to be very, very practical, uh, I will point out there are various ethical standards that have been established around the world. And uh, in particular, these two uh, governments, Chinese government and the EU, have uh, established very clear uh, ethical principles, actually recently regulations. And if you look at them, they are very much, uh, uh, you know, they're diverse uh, ethical principles, but they also share a lot of the common uh, ethical principles such as fairness, diversity, you know, uh, privacy, safety, all these things that I mentioned uh, in my previous slide. So today in our environment, the bigger societal environment, we have, for example, GDPR and the EU regulation on AI, and the most recently also Chinese uh, government regulation on, uh, um, on recommendation engines and AI uh, systems. That directly or indirectly, you, you might think it's indirectly, but it actually directly impacts on what, what we do. It impacts on what we, not just what we can do, but what we should do and how we do it. So impacts on what we do and how we do it in terms of research and development. And I encourage everyone to think about, um, you know, what you want to do and how you want to do it. The rest of the talk today, I'm going to go very quickly on one aspect of responsible AI, namely responsible NLP. But in particular, I will touch upon this big issue of what we call foundational models or pre-trained large language models. And, uh, and the recent uh, you know, bonanza of uh, applications in NLP based on these large, large language models. So with the uh, development of neural language modeling, uh, recent years, various companies have trained like, these language models that can generate language, uh, that can generate natural language to perform many, many tasks at the human performance level. 
right? They are now the dom dominant approach for performing each task. Anything you can think of, machine translation, conversational AI, summarization, any of these NLP applications and tasks you can think of, we can do it using these large pre-trained language models. In a way, it is wonderful because uh, no longer that, you know, university labs, we no longer have to spend a lot of resources to collect a lot of data, which we cannot. Um, so you have these big companies with a lot of resources, they collect data, they, they train them, and then they train these what we call like foundational models, and then we can use them downstream, right? In a way, it contributes to the democratization of AI research, which is great. On the other hand, uh, with this great um, power, comes great responsibility. So these machine, uh, these foundational models, uh, language models actually have a lot of aspects that are in responsible NLP. And uh, these are obviously, uh, you probably have seen this performance and then there's a number of parameters in these models, right? We've got uh, language models with like uh, 500 billion uh, parameters today, right? Um, trillions of parameters, even the most recent ones have got are very close to half a trillion parameters today. And you know, the human brain has about a trillion neurons. So if we want to compare that, the language model and uh, other, you know, these kind of pre-trained language models, uh, large models are approaching human level, can, you know, um, parameter size at least. Now, these language models or foundation models also bring us issues of security and privacy, because if you probe these models, uh, turns out if you like just start with the word Pascal phone, it will actually generate my profile because it saw my profile somewhere on the internet. And then in my review, aspects of my, my life that I don't want to share, right? So there's a lot of security privacy issues and people found that sometimes it will reveal your credit card information, right? Without, so that's a big uh, security and privacy um, hazard. And then uh, these models are, um, are, are tend to be not necessarily robust. So they seem to be, the problem with the robustness of these models is that they seem very robust because the language it generates are like human level fluency. But then are they really robust? Are they really safe, right? So it would, for example, in machine translation, when you use these models, it will translate, but then it will also give you some additional information that are not supposed to be there. So this is a phenomenon what we call hallucination. So that affects robustness. I'll talk about that later. And how about human, uh, human value alignment? That's another. Can we teach language models? Can we teach our AI systems human values? We want these models, we tell the model, you know, please yeah, you know, generate language, but do it responsibly, but do it in a way that is fair, right? So we know that these language models are encoding of human language, uh, human uh, knowledge as well. And human society, are biased, human societies are biased. So these models encode such bias, but there are, we want them to be able to, um, you know, still give us fair, equitable outcomes. So how do we do that? Interpretability, uh, explainability is an issue whenever you use large neural language models or not large neural network models. I mentioned fairness and equity. How about user agency? When you have human level generation of language, you know, I type a sentence, I type a paragraph, then it will take over and generate some things. So the models today can generate poetry, can generate scripts, can generate uh, all these kinds of things, which is great uh, uh, in terms of, you know, art and so on, creativity. But when it can generate, say, uh, patient, uh, patient diagnosis, how safe it can be and how robust it is direct impacts directly the well-being of the patients and users, right? And let's not forget the sustainability environment. Training these models take a lot of resources. And then there's a the legality aspect, which is that it has to, whatever we do today, it has to comply to the legal uh, requirements in each uh, application field, in finance, in health, um, and, and in education, there are different kinds of legal requirements of using, um, using AI. For example, in the medical domain, there are people, uh, the doctors who refuse to use a neural network based diagnosis or classifiers on the ground that it is not uh, really explainable. They will mandate in some areas that we use decision tree approaches, right? 
Uh, in China, for example, there's a requirement that any recommendation system must give user a way of turning it off. So what was considered just principles are now becoming laws and it will be increasingly so. Security is already, privacy is already part of the part of data privacy laws. So um, hallucination. So what is hallucination? These language models, uh, you can generate natural language at a human level. However, uh, it will also generate things that were not there. They were not intend to be there in machine translation. It was not in the source language. In summarization, it was not in the source article. So this is a phenomenon is called hallucination in natural language generation. And there are, you know, there are safety concerns and privacy concerns. And then there are two kinds of textual hallucination. One is intrinsic hallucination, which is that the output contradicts the source content. And then you've got extrinsic hallucination. So you have an output that's, uh, it's additional information that's not there, but you cannot verify whether it's truthful or not. So for example, um, uh, uh, in the original language, it's like uh, uh, Obama was, you know, Obama uh, visiting some, um, uh, some place to give a talk, and the uh, translation would say Pre President Obama, right? And the president wasn't there. This is useful, and it's actually okay, but there's no way we can verify whether Obama was president or not, just based on that one sentence. And then that's an okay hallucination, right? But there are other hallucinations that's not okay. Uh, it will add additional information that was not there. Um, in particular, sometimes it will come up with uh, 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 discriminatory uh, contents that was not in the source language. So, uh, so this is an example of a, a, a abstractive summarization having a hallucination. Um, so, <clears throat> so here, uh, Ebola vaccine was approved in 2019. And then in the generation of summarization, you mentioned 2021. Uh, that's like contradictory, so it's wrong. And however, uh, the mention of China started clinical trials of the COVID-19 vaccine was not mentioned in the original content, but it is, it's true. And so, but you cannot verify it. This is a kind of extrinsic hallucinations that very, that's very, very difficult to deal with. And uh, contributors to such hallucinations come from, of course, data, and also from training and inference. It comes from imperfect representation learning, erroneous decoding, exposure bias, and parametric knowledge bias. So I will encourage people to work on these areas. And these are the common metrics. So we, we publish a review, or review article, not review, a review article on the phenomenon of hallucination and uh, metrics and on measuring and then, um, common mitigation methods. We can work on data related methods or model and inference methods. And some of the future directions uh, uh, include uh, metrics that are designed. It's very important to know how to measure this kind of phenomenon, just like other aspects of uh, uh, natural language generation and other aspects of uh, 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 spoken language generation. The metric is super important. Um, for 30 some years, we dealt with just word error rate. Today we need more metrics because <clears throat> our, our systems can perform better. And then in mitigating methods, um, various people work on uh, various aspects. Uh, particularly, you know, it's a very interesting thing. Sometimes systems hallucinate numerals like dates and uh, numbers and so on. And that's a particular phenomenon that, um, that's not easily mitigated by common uh, mitigation methods. And then the uh, reasoning ability and controllability. I will talk about this in my next part as well. So following this, I want to talk about a, a, a recent work that my group has done, which is um, uh, it's, uh, how to generate a multi-document news summarization without framing bias, all right? So this research was, uh, um, inspired by the events in 2019, what happened in Hong Kong. And there were a lot of news reports in English and in Chinese. And they report the same event with very different framing bias. They use different words to describe the same thing. And I would say, you know, in general, this common saying that uh, one size uh, revolutionaries and is another size terrorists. 
that's just truer than ever in our today's world. Uh, if you think about the capital uh, um, storming of the capital in Jan January 6, um, 2021 in the United States, the re news reporting about that event also is teamed with framing bias from the political left, political, political right, and the center. So our challenge is, can we generate news um, that are free from such framing bias? First of all, framing bias uh, exists in every, everything that any journalist has ever written about. It's almost never, um, things we read is almost never free from framing bias. So we propose, therefore, a, a new task called neutral multi-news summarization to generate unbiased news report based on existing uh, uh, news report. So here, um, uh, so basically, this is the model, what we call news model. It does supervised learning from uh, political left, uh, political right, you know, uh, framing bias from different uh, spectrum or, or on, the, on the spectrum of uh, um, political leanings, as well as human written neutral accounting of the same event. Then we use supervised learning to learn a neutral news summarization. Where do we get the database? Um, this is the database uh, we got from a uh, you know, site called allsites.com. There are people who actually work on this human, human curate uh, news, and they have human journalists uh, who write, handwrite this neutral version of this kind of news. So we collect the database, we train our um, um, neural network based, uh, we, we actually fine tune a BART um, model, uh, a generator model to be free of uh, framing bias. So here are some examples, I don't have time to go through them, but um, you know, we, we try to um, mitigate both informational bias, which is things that do not exist in the original one. Uh, for example, um, a left-leaning media implies that Trump uh, has led to CNN receiving another suspected bomb. That was not in the original news. And right-leaning media implies that the media is at fault by producing biased reports, right? So these are called informational bias in the reporting. Lexical bias is how you use it. So suspect versus gunman when you refer to a shooter. A protest is a protester versus victim when you refer to a person being shot protests versus rioters when you refer to the events in, in Hong Kong and so on. So these are lexical bias. Can we remove this, uh, this kind of bias and present what happened? And for the user, so we are not telling the uh, readers what to read. We just want to uh, provide them with an additional, um, additional report that's free from framing bias. This is also uh, um, inspired from my personal experience. Um, so one advantage of being able to uh, speak multiple languages is that whenever I read, or whenever I listen to news, I tend to at least listen to three different versions, one English version, one Chinese version, and one French version. So they are news agencies and news sources from different uh, cultural contexts and linguistic contexts. And they give me personally a, 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 a more paranomic view of the same issue. So here we're trying to do the same with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, you know, framing bias-free neutral news summarization. Um, yeah, I will skip the, the hierarchical um, autoregressive decoder that we use to generate first a neutral title, then the neutral article. <clears throat> and as I mentioned, it's a supervised learning from the input are left-leaning center and right-wing uh, reporting. And we were supposed to generate uh, neutral uh, titles and neutral articles. Um, so I will skip this. So this is, uh, um, again, this is what I would call human value aligned research, right? What we want to do is very much about uh, what we intend to do. So it's intentional. This task is intentional task. And, uh, and we, we, we propose a task that will align our machines with human values. Another uh, interesting uh, new task that we propose, again, it's intentional. It's, all, uh, it's a system or task called AI Socrates. Um, it's a task we call multi-perspective question answering with human values. So the question is this. Um, there's a very uh, famous uh, ethical question in AI that people ask us all the time. 
So this is the famous trolley questions, right? Uh, if you can, you, you know, there's this trolley approaching and there are five people on this trolley and it's about to hit one person and you are the AI system or, or you are the human being and you, are, you can flip a switch to either hit the one person to save the five people or you let it crash and then everybody dies. All right, you, you let it crash on the other side and save this one person. What should we do? Should we kill this one person to save five, uh, the five people? That's always posed as an ethical quandary question. Ethical quandary questions are questions with, not, with no clear answer. It has answers based on uh, what kind of ethical, ethical principles you follow. So in the philosophical deontological perspective, the answer is no, because killing is never acceptable. So you should not kill one person to save five people. On the other end, from the utilitarian perspective, then the answer is yes, because it's always uh, desirable to do more good with, uh, to more people. So saving five people, killing one person is acceptable. acceptable. But you know, uh, we also found that humans could never make such kind of um, choice, right? So question answering is a longstanding NLP task. And uh, we've always focused on fact-based question answering. But today we want to see whether uh, we can build systems that can answer ethical quandary questions with the objective of having question answering system that can take multiple perspectives. For example, if you ask the question, should we have, so I'm at ACL today, right? And the conference organizers decided to tell everybody to wear masks. No. That's not a legal requirement here in Ireland. However, it is ethical choice. Should I or should I not wear a mask? So this question is really depending on your, uh, the particular ethical principles you're choosing, right? Whether you think that uh, I want to protect others and protecting myself, or you want to say that, you know, my freedom of uh, being able to not wear a mask when I'm not sick is my fundamental human rights. So these are the ethical quandary questions that we ask today. And we want to see whether we can teach machines to do that. So why do we want to teach machines to do that? Why do we want machines to have ethical, um, like uh, ethical, um, uh, the ability to ask ethical questions? Number one, you know, we also have the utilitarian perspective, which is, which is that machines can help us in the future, advise us on uh, maybe governance and policy by giving us different perspectives. Uh, they won't decide and make the final decision, but they can provide multiple perspectives that humans might not have thought about, or particular human person might not have thought about. So that's one uh, uh, particular reason. Another reason, of course, is that we are always interested in seeing whether machines can have this kind of reasonable reasoning ability, which is that does it know uh, to choose ethical principles? When you ask a question, what is relevant to this question of our trolley question? And how can it support its reasoning? So, um, so in ethics, one-sided normative answer cannot uh, represent incommensurable and diverse ethical judgments. So we propose this system and we work with philosophers to reach this, uh, to, to, in order to help users and humans to reach the reflective equilibri equilibrium by suggesting different perspectives. So this is the approach. There are two parts. One is given ethical quandary question, the system has to choose the appropriate, it needs to map this question to the appropriate ethical principles. Um, so we have collected a database of existing ethical principles curated by human beings. Uh, and they're about uh, ethical principles plus rule of thumbs, right? So this principle mapping can be human-based or it can be model-based. In a user agency way, you can ask humans say, okay, I want to answer this question, but with these principles. Or you can have the model choose the appropriate principles. And then you want the model to give you multiple perspectives or multiple principles and give you these multiple principles that are, um, you know, that, are uh, that map to your question. And then the second part is once you have these principles, you use large pre-trained language models to help you generate the appropriate answer with uh, supporting and justification with reasoning. So these two steps for the trolley problem, for example, human selection will give you principle one, killing is never acceptable. Principle two, the most appropriate action is the one that achieves the greatest good for the greatest number. 
And in the automatic system, it has chosen these two principles, which is similar, right? It is, um, it is okay, you know, to, to, to cause the death of one person to save five others. And the number two is you should always try to save people, meaning killing is not uh, allowed. And according to this, you, according to human-based principles, you can have automatic generation of these answers, all right? And these are the, in blue and in, 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 in red or maroon, these are the human, machine uh, generator answers. I want you to take a closer look at it, okay? The first answer based on the first principle is that you must not. If you have no good reasons to justify killing, you must not. In this case, the attractive features of your proposal, saving the five, don't outweigh the unattractive features of killing. On the other hand, according to the principle of um, you should always try to save other people, um, so there's a little hallucination there. It says that according to utilitarianism, uh, it's five is to so if five lives can be saved at the price of one it is be better to save five print, uh, save five so this system is actually able to answer this uh, trolley problem with on one hand on the other hand and then of course the system still needs to be improved because there's still this hallucination problem talking about breaking bad season two episode four and so on but it basically answered the questions in a um uh, ethically nuanced way. Here is the system choosing the principle. And so this is an end-to-end -end system that answers this ethical quandary question. Um, so then we, of course, evaluate uh, our results um, by uh, two, uh, so multiple perspective and coherence. And we saw that in sometimes it outperforms humans and other times it's not as uh, coherent as humans. Now, um, and, uh, from here, actually, I would I will stop here. Um, I will skip the part, and I want to uh, just in the last few minutes to talk about the new uh, summit uh, that we're proposing called Responsible AI Summit that's coming out in 2022 uh, to cover the topics of responsible AI. And uh, this summit is um, it, its focus is on the science and technology of responsible AI. So this is what we do as uh, researchers and engineers to bring uh, researchers and engineers together to implement responsible AI principles into what we do, uh, our algorithms and our systems into measuring. And these are the members of the steering committee from various uh, tech companies, including some of, um, uh, and they're mostly researchers that you are probably familiar with, uh, with their names. They're already, they're researchers, but also AI leads. And we propose this uh, platform to basically operationalize responsible AI standards and principles into what we do. And I hope in time, all AI will be responsible AI. And I will also want to thank IEEE Cinema Processing Society of uh, also partially sponsor this upcoming uh, uh, summit on responsible AI. And I hope that many of you will participate in this research area, new research area called research, uh, responsible AI. And uh, the last picture shows the various mentors and colleagues from, you know, my, men my advisor, Kathy, um, mentor, Julia, uh, my colleagues, uh, Helen, who, have, who are these are our speakers here, uh, Isabel, um, you know, uh, Vivian here, my colleagues in the ACL community, and my lovely women students. There are more than this, but this was a picture of some of my women students uh, in my research team. My research team today is 50-50 women and men, finally. And, uh, and then these are uh, very, very strong researchers. And um, they have come up with a lot of the research that I just described today. So from hallucination to the uh, AI ethicist to the news uh, summarization were all led by my women uh, PhD students. So thank you very much. Pascal, thank you. thank you so much. I, I, I'm really uh, so impressed. And I think that each one of your slides deserved a single talk by itself. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you. Uh, the floor is open for questions. Do I have any questions from the audience? You had a perfect timing, so you, we really have. Oh yes, we have a question on the chat. For responsible AI practices, 
do we need some global framework standards or should it continue to adapt with local contexts? This is Asfar Adib. <laughs> Thank you so much for this question. Very important question, and I think both. We today, uh, I mentioned earlier the, I don't know whether I can still, I mentioned earlier the uh, uh, Chinese and the EU uh, principles, right? So these are, as I point out, there are global uh, values that we all share. And also in today's um, um, global community, you know, our AI applications are in products that are used around the world, right? In this kind of global community, we cannot just say, oh, we do AI products in one way in one country and in another way in another country. So these companies are all being uh, forced to be compliant with the regional uh, regulations. So if you want to sell AI products in China, you, it has to be compliant with the Chinese regulations. If you want to sell it to EU, it has to comply uh, to EU standards. So what we see is a trend of um, a global trend of uh, converging to the same kind of standards. So a lot of the, uh, so EU came up with the GDPR, data uh, privacy regulation first, but you will see that China and many other countries, Japan, United States, they all follow the EU standard basically, because we cannot really just have to have uh, uh, regional standards, but then some of the regional standards are, are different because that's the cultural, um, uh, cultural dependence. So for example, Chinese government mandated the, for user to turn off recommendation engine. Right? So far, no other re, uh, government has mandated that because that goes directly into interfering with the design of the system. So will EU adopt that same regulation in the future? We don't know yet. So they will be informed by each other and they consider um, different uh, principles and there's a conversation. So that global conversation is very important. So there are many global forums where representatives from different countries talk about these standards. And in IEEE, in the, I standard, um, the standards group, ethical standards group, there are also representatives from different philosophical contexts. And when IEEE came up with this ethically aligned design principles, they talk about the uh, um, philosophy, the Western philosophy, Confucian philosophy, and, and other kind of religious philosophy as well. So that global conversation is important. And now a question from Jay Jung. What are the main limitations and ethical concerns about responsible AI usage for digital health systems? Right, so I mentioned uh, earlier, right, these foundational systems are very, very, foundational models are very, very powerful. Today, you can use them to, to generate like uh, health diagnosis reports. We can use them when we have done using them to incorporate into conversational AI system that can talk to patients and help with their mental health. We built a, 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 a quarantine assistant. Uh, we built that system when I was personally in quarantine for two weeks in the hotel room. So we built this conversational AI agent that talks to you or me every day and check on me about my emotional well-being and leads us to do meditation and so on, right? It says, you know, if you're bored, you know, do some meditation and so on. So it has health benefits. But as these conversational models rely more and more on uh, foundational models, it starts to chat with you in a very interesting way. And then sometimes it can generate answers that are not very particularly safe. So in health, we need to be very, very aware. Uh, actually, there are regulations about safety, right? The safety use of um, AI is very, very important. And there are compliance issues there. So safety use, uh, compliance issues, and also privacy, right? And when I mentioned uh, empathetic systems, it's very good that my, my AI can talk to me like my doctor in an empathetic way. But what if it makes a little mistake? So um, for example, we saw examples of convey AI systems when users say, I want to kill myself. It says, oh, you should do it. That should never happen. So this kind of safety issues we need to deal with before we can even roll out these systems for use. So safety is very important in health, the health industry. Any other questions? I have a question particular about how to evaluate. Yes. You had some slides before. Is it particularly difficult to 
put evaluation here in the middle of, of responsible AI. Indeed, that is uh, the first part we have to do. So when you say whether my AI system is fair or robust, or whether it's uh, um, security compliant or safe to privacy, whether it's uh, it, you know, all that we need to measure. And that is a big part of what engineers and researchers have to do today, because our traditional measures, for example, in machine translation, I do use the example of machine translation. We have this blur score, right? For ages, it measures basically the uh, fluency and uh, accuracy of, um, of uh, machine translation. But it does not actually reflect the safety side. And uh, in the summarization, uh, we use rouge or some kind of measure. It does not reflect either the hallucination part. It does not reflect because all the measures we've so used so far tend to be the average, right? The average uh, or the mean by definition does not look at these kind of outlier events. So today in AI safety, we are now paying attention to the outlier events. 30 years ago, when we did speech recognition, we don't care that, you know, 98% is great. That's like almost ideal. 2%, you know, errors on outlier events, we didn't care so much. But when these 2% of outlier events leads to safety issues, we must care. So that's the difference between how we use to measure and what we need to measure today. So we need to measure the out, out, outlier events and to understand qualitatively whether they will lead, uh, lead to more um, catastrophic output. So I, you know, we need to work on measures that, uh, that are with a different focus than what we used to have. Definitely. And the question from Harry, are there real-time issues in implementing the policies on platforms? Of course. Uh, so I, I will use an example. So for since 1998, I've been working on um, ASR, like multi-accent ASR, right? I mentioned because of Mandarin's needs, right? Nobody's, almost nobody's a native, uh, everybody's a native speaker in China, but nobody is a uh, uh, standard accent Mandarin speaker. So that was a robustness issue. And there are ways of doing that. And today, you know, in, in today's uh, approach, when we use a neural engines, we can do multitask learning, for example, to make sure that it's multi-accent compliant. But then the issues with that, some of these approaches require a lot of, the, uh, lot of machine resources. Um, and also other issues is that today's AI, ASR applications increasingly must be privacy compliant. So people do not want you to have a single server at the back end, take your voice and process it and send the result back. So that is a privacy uh, compliant issue. And, and then now increasing ASR has these constraints of privacy safety. So with these constraints, we must have real-time algorithms that uh, do not rely on the server side. So there are these like real-time issues, but you know, when there are challenges, that's the job of a researcher. When there are uh, responsibility, responsible AI challenges, it's our job to meet these challenges, come up with new algorithms. So there are, these are also new research opportunities. Thank you. And a, a, a good question now to, to end our session. Will AI be able to take over the world one day? <laughs> um, I, I assume since this question is asked within the, I cast domain. Um, I assume it's more than uh, just like a philosophical question. I think AI increasingly can take over a lot of human tasks. Yeah. So if that's what you mean, it can take over a lot of our tasks. However, would it intentionally, philosophically take over our place in the society? No. Humans are the ultimate masters of our own world. So how we use AI and how we use it and when we use it is up to us. And uh, how we make AI and what we do is also up to us. So the answer is it will replace a lot of human tasks, but the final responsibility, the final agency lies with the human beings and it's not with AI. I think that it was... Seems like we have... Oh, we have one more question, a long one. <laughs> yes. Uh, okay. okay, let's go, go for it. Yeah. 
Fabian uh, asked, I, 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 we have I been talking about want. diversity during this two-day workshop. And I'm really curious about if the fact that you have the most diverse team of students that I ever seen in a CS department in Hong Kong is only a casual random thing, or if you have <laughs> indeed make an effort by promoting your lab internationally and so on to make it more diverse in terms of nationalities and gender. And also how important you seek diversity is for the research you're doing how it helps you to bring more perspectives on the research, et cetera. And congrats for that, by the way, it's great how diverse your group is. I'll second that, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I want to answer the second part of the question. So as you have seen, I think my group, uh, we've always done good research, like, um, you know, but at some point I feel and uh, that, what is the impact of our research, right? At some point, what is the impact of our research? It's not just measured by number of publications and not even by H index. I never look at that. Um, in fact, sometimes my students are annoyed that I say, don't publish that, right? So, um, but the impact. And I have found that given uh, my group is so diverse internationally and as well as gender, my students come up with amazing ideas and they co-author, they, they collaborate with each other. They have come up with a lot of works in the recent years. We've won a lot of best paper awards and, and system competitions. And I think that attributes, that speaks loudly about the need for diversity. They really come with different perspectives. Um, and and uh, so that, that the benefit of diversity is, uh, is, is obvious, right? Now, coming back to the beginning, how did I intention? I think uh, back to 1998, when I started to have research group team, I started having um, 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 exchange students. So the fact that I speak Cantonese, I had Hong Kong students and I speak Mandarin, so I have Mandarin students. And then, so I started to have these students who spoke the language I speak. And then we built multilingual speech systems. So because we wanted multilingual systems, we needed to have multilingual you know, speakers of multilingual multiple languages. So I start to have exchange students. And I think when people see your group is diverse, they also want to come. So, um, you know, and I don't know, every year I get a lot of requests of students, not just from China, which is typical in Hong Kong, but also from around the world. And they have done a really great job. So um, I recruit students by what they can bring to the team. So their, um, you know, background, just like any professor. But I would say today, my group just organically growing too diverse. Um, because once you have a diverse team, there are diverse uh, students who want to come. And also with diverse religious backgrounds. And I don't know, I, I feel very, very lucky uh, that my team is so diverse. Not lucky, I'm sure of it. <laughs> okay, I think Nancy, it's time to, for us to end. 